Buenas tardes, eh, bienvenidos a... Good afternoon. Welcome to Casa Arabe, to this presentation of the book by Patrick uh, Coburn, uh, The Era of Yihad. We also have the participation of Daniel Iriarte from the newspaper El Confidencial. Patrick Cockburn, as you well know, is a veteran journalist of The Independent. He has uh, been working for many countries. You have all the information regarding his biography in the uh, sheet that regarding this event. And we also have the books outside. Uh, the end of the conference, he, Patrick, will be uh, here to sign them if you want to. The coverage that Patrick Coburn has been doing of the conflicts in the Middle East and other conflicts is uh, uncompared to uh, the work of other journalists. In his articles, he, use his wide, he uses his wide experience and profound knowledge of the history of the region, and particularly Iraq and Middle East in general. And he's demonstrated that he can do a very accurate analysis and in some occasions even predict disasters that have affected the region. This book specifically um, is uh, presented in the way of a captivating diary. It includes uh, the text of uh, Patrick Cogburn from the uh, war fronts of Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria with uh, in-depth analysis of the region and also a contemporary reflection. Patrick was telling me before the conference that sometimes it is difficult to find books that are not only academic and that talk about the work in, in there on the grounds. And sometimes we have texts from journalists that don't include a historical analysis uh, to be able to understand better the region. So this book is a great combination of these perspectives. It is the story of a tragedy with uh, many nuances in contrast with the claims of politicians and the media. I'm going to quote a part of the book. These are not black and white situations. We're not talking about good against evil. It's not a tyrant against rioters, as in a scene from Les Miserables. It is surprising and uh, depressing to see how Western governments uh, commit their countries towards uh, wars without acknowledging this basic fact. We have to understand all the nuances involved. The conflicts um, um, uh, that are related to these misunderstandi misunderstandings have been extended in uh, several Western uh, cities, provoking a violent reaction. The effects only make things worse. Let's think about the attacks in France, in Belgium, or in the US. This situation, very febrile, the profound work undertaken by journalists such as Patrick Cogburn is essential. His knowledge of Iraq can illustrate uh, and illustrate us when we find, in the, for example, in the war between Russia and Chechnya, uh, the seeds of jihadism that is now uh, eroding Middle East. We have facts that demonstrate that the states in the region ha are getting weaker and weaker. For example, with uh, the examples of Daesh, Al-Qaeda, Yaradas Nostra, 
The book is chronological. It starts with the Taliban in 2001, and it finishes with the life during the Caliphate in 2015. The epilogue of uh, Patrick Cogburn leaves us with the feeling that the box of Pandora's box has been open. These monsters will not we will not be able to uh, enclose them again in the box. We will now um, let Patrick uh, to tell, tell us how this book uh, has uh, was written and by its title in English, Chaos and Caliphate, Yihadist and uh, the, uh, the West in the Struggle for Middle East. So thank you uh, very much, Patrick, for your presence. Thank you to Capital Swing, to the publishing house uh, for publishing this. After Patrick's intervention, we will uh, listen to Daniel Iriarte. We will open a dialogue and then we will open a Q&A session. Please, so please, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, this is obviously a particularly good time to be uh, considering this uh, topic because we have the siege of East Aleppo going on in Syria, and we have the um, uh, gradual encirclement of uh, Mosul in northern Iraq by the Iraqi army, the Kurds, other forces. Uh, and this is sort of probably Iraq and Syria are full of crucial moments, but probably this is a real crucial moment in this ongoing conflict. Not a final moment, not the beginning of the end, but a, a very important turning point. And this is happening a week before uh, the American uh, presidential election on the 8th of November, which may see a change in US policy, whoever wins it. It looks as though Hillary Clinton will, but uh, this year has been uh, full of uh, uh, surprises when it comes to uh, elections, uh, whether they're in Britain or Colombia, uh, and possibly in America. Um, let me talk a little about the, the siege of uh, Mosul, or the impending siege of Mosul, because that's the, the topic of the hour. Um, it's, uh, I think, a very important development and the perception that Islamic State is getting weaker is certainly true. If they've lost their main other cities, Fallujah, Ramadi in Iraq, um, Sinjar in the edge of Kurdistan, Palmyra and in um, uh, Syria. So it's under pressure. Uh, I think that I don't know how people would have seen it on television, the attack on Mosul, uh, which is moving very slowly. And is rather peculiar, because it's conducted by different forces that are both allies and rivals at the same time, notably the Iraqi army, the Kurdish Peshmerga, Turkey wants to have a role uh, in determining what happens in Mosul. It has 3,000 troops there. And you have the Shia paramilitaries, the Shia militias, and the um, Sunni militias uh, all potentially getting involved. Above all, you have the US and the US-led Air Force. Because I think it's important to bear in mind that none of these armies on the ground are really particularly strong. Uh, they're strong because they can cause or call on sort of devastating uh, airstrikes from the US and US allied air forces overhead. Whenever I've been covering the fighting in that area, and you're, let's say you're with a Peshmerga unit, and it's come under attack from ISIS, Daesh, whatever you want to call it, uh, they really don't do much fighting. They call up the operations room in Erbil and call in airstrikes against Daesh. Um, and uh, the same is uh, true of the Iraqi army, which is why you have such massive destruction. I mean, there is great public outcry, and 
great in Europe, and quite rightly, about what's happened in East Aleppo, destruction by Russian and uh, Syrian aircraft there. But you know, it's worth keeping in mind that Ramadi uh, in uh, western Iraq, which used to be a city of 350,000, is now 80% destroyed by a U.S. and other airstrikes. Um, the, what's going to happen in Mosul? Well, they haven't really got into Mosul yet. A lot depends on whether Islamic State will defend it or not. Um, I suspect they will to a degree because capturing Mosul in 2014 was their first great victory. They uh, portrayed it as a sign that, of divine assistance that God was on their side. Uh, it's a city of one million people, quite a lot of the population still under their control. I don't think they'll give it up just like that. But then one of the important things to appreciate about Daesh, about the Islamic State uh, organization, that it's a peculiar and very powerful mixture of extreme and rather crazy religious fanaticism, on the one hand, combined with quite genuine military expertise on the other. And certainly from what we've seen of the fighting over the last year in places I mentioned, Fallujah, Ramadi, Sinjar, more recently Manbij in Syria, is that Islamic State have not been fighting to the last man. They fight in order to cause casualties through suicide bombing and IEDs, improvised explosive devices, booby traps, snipers, mortar teams, but it, they generally withdraw at the last moment. Now, I think in Mosul they'll fight, and, but I don't think they'll... That won't be the end of the matter. They'll want to, they won't want to commit all their best uh, soldiers to this battle, because they won't want to fight on elsewhere later. So, but they'll want to draw out the siege of Mosul, uh, get the Iraqi army involved in street fighting, was it would be more difficult for the Americans and the others to use their uh, air power there, to have airstrikes, because particularly in view of the sort of media of the world, they won't want to destroy the whole city. So it may be easier for ISIS to, to fight there. Uh, but it looks likely that it'll be a long, drawn-out uh, process. Um, the... Uh, We've got the American presidential election coming up. Then, you know, will American policy change in Syria? Um, Obama has been criticized for his uh, passivity, uh, for not intervening. But I think that this is a little simple-minded. I think it, perhaps Obama could see the dangers of doing things to a degree to which George W. Bush and perhaps Hillary Clinton could not. It's easy to criticize somebody who hasn't done something like military intervention in Syria in 2013. But certainly, you know, if they had intervened then, um, it wouldn't have ended the war. If Assad had gone, the only alternatives were really uh, Islamic State and al-Nusra. Um, that um, uh, the fighting would certainly have, go have gone on. So I think that Obama's approach actually has been perhaps more intelligent than he gets credit for. Um, the book I've written, The Age of Jihad, um, tries to combine two things. One is sort of eyewitness reporting at the time by myself on a series of wars and political conflicts that were part of those wars uh, as I saw them. Um, and I hope this has the credibility of eyewitness reporting. I think this is, this is always important, anything one is uh, trying to understand, that, somebody, that there are genuine eyewitnesses who are non-partisan. But I think it's particularly important in this case because my feeling is that over the years, and this really begins with the Afghan War of 2001, um, 
if you like, it's the post-9-11 wars. Uh, my feeling was at that time, and still is, that these wars were not very well reported, weren't very well understood, that propaganda played a big role, that people didn't really appreciate uh, what was really happening on the ground. So the book uh, deals with that, and then, I mean, has this reporting, which I haven't altered from when I wrote it. Uh, and then it has chapters which are more generalized, analyzing what happened. Because, you know, it's rather extraordinary in the Middle East that we've entered this sort of period of wars, of states collapsing, of states being overthrown. If you go from the Pakistan border in the east and right through South Asia, through the Middle East, through North Africa, there are, I think, eight wars going on. And this isn't counting insurgencies. You have the war in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, uh, in Libya, in Somalia, in South Sudan. You have the wars uh, in, um, but with Boko Haram around uh, northeast Nigeria. And these wars have quite a lot in common of uh, that they don't end. They start, but they don't end. The one in Afghanistan started 79-80, in Somalia in 91. Uh, um, they go on and on. They spread instability. And, you know, ISIS is very much the child of war. It comes out of war. Um, it provided fertile soil for ISIS and Al-Qaeda type organizations to grow. So I try and explain the different reasons why these states uh, collapsed, why there was foreign intervention, why the Islamists benefited from this. You know, in past eras, the main vehicle for protests in these countries was often nationalist regimes or socialist regimes. But it's become clear since the 1990s that nationalism and socialism don't appear to provide a vehicle for protest against the status quo anymore. So in the Middle East, that its religion is the one uh, thing that provides the glue that holds societies together or provides the uh, vehicle for those who want to change the way uh, society is run that wants to have, will want to have a revolution, that want to overthrow the state. Um, but going back to the, the content of the book, the narrative content, it starts with the... Actually, it, it doesn't quite start with the Afghan war, but I put in a few, a bit about sanctions against Iraq, which from 1990 to 2003, UN economic sanctions. People tend to think of sanctions as somehow being more humane than war. But you know, sanctions against Iraq were very strong. They basically destroyed the economy. They uh, impoverished Iraqi society as a whole. They didn't hurt Saddam Hussein very much. His family made a great deal of money out of it because when there are shortages, the people who can avoid the shortages are the ruling family. Uh, Uday, Saddam's son, had a, a very useful monopoly in cigarettes, which used to bring in cigarettes. They're mostly fake cigarettes, actually, made in Turkey bring them in through Kurdistan down to Baghdad. Iraqis smoke a lot. Uh, you know, this is worth five or six million dollars a month at that time. Anyway, this is just an example how sanctions hit the poorest, the weakest, the sickest in society. Uh, they don't hurt, they didn't hurt Saddam Hussein and his family. The current sanctions against Syria don't hurt Assad. They do hurt ordinary Syrians. They do mean if you're a hospital administrator or you're an NGO, a foreign aid organization trying to, uh, uh, you know, um, get spare parts for the x-ray machines in hospitals, they're almost impossible to get because there's a tremendous bureaucracy in doing so. It's very difficult to get any bank to deal with anything to do with Syria because they're frightened of uh, um, uh, the U.S. authorities uh, fining them very large amounts, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, so it begins with that. But anyway, after that, I start with the 
Iraq, I think that's underappreciated. People have actually forgotten that the, the, these sanctions ever happened, but they may have killed half a million Iraqis. They may have killed more Iraqis than uh, Saddam Hussein ever did. Uh, but the Iraq war, which was really the other beginning, because this book is really about wars, um, wars post 9-11, and I felt that, that war wasn't really understood. First of all, actually, there wasn't much war. There wasn't much fighting. I was in a village north of Kabul for about three months uh, before the uh, bombing started and, um, and then went down to Kabul. Later, I went from Kabul, took the road from Kabul, a truly terrible road, uh, down to Kandahar. Uh, and the Taliban was retreating, it was giving up, but it hadn't really militarily been defeated. There wasn't actually that much fighting. Uh, though this wouldn't have necessarily been evident from television, you'd see bombs going off and uh, so forth, but uh, there wasn't necessarily anybody under the bombs. Why? Because the Taliban, they, their leaders knew they were bound to lose if they fought at that moment. They were also very dependent on Pakistan, probably the Pakistanis had told them don't fight now, wait. So they were going back to their villages. They were going to back to Pakistan. Uh, the, but they weren't, uh, they weren't surrendering and they hadn't been defeated. And this was very important for what happened later in, in Afga Afghanistan because the US and other, the rest of the world then proceeded to try and create a new government in Afghanistan which kind of assumed that the Taliban was gone, that it was a memory from yesterday. But actually, I remember going to Kandahar, somebody asked me, you know, you know, could they help me? And I said, well, I'd like to meet the local uh, uh, Taliban commanders. This was just after the Taliban was supposedly defeated. And he said, right, you know, let's do it. So I said, when? He said, we'll do it right now. So we went to a village, you know, and the message was sent out to the Taliban commanders. They'd all gone back to their villages. They all came back completely confident and said, look, you know, we've given up for the moment, but if people pursue us, if they persecute us, you know, we'll go back to war, which is exactly what happened. Um, you know, all this was fairly obvious at the time, that there really wasn't much of a war, but there was a potential for the Taliban coming back. Then it goes on to the, really, the great sort of explosion which has ripped apart the Middle East is the American-led invasion of Iraq of 2003. Uh, it was so important because anything that happens in Iraq and Syria, it affects all the neighboring countries. The, this has always been historically for thousands of years a sort of almost, you know, talk in geological terms, a sort of tectonic, tectonic plates meet, except they're sort of political, religious, military tectonic plates. The barrier, the front line between the Ottoman Empire and the Safavid, the Persian Empire, w really went through Iraq. It's one of the reasons Iraq, for, for centuries nobody really controlled Iraq. The Ottomans controlled the cities a bit, but it's why Iraq is, one of the reasons Iraq is such a violent place, why they, they've always been armed. It's rather amazing under Saddam Hussein, this dictator, that all, all, all Iraqis had weapons at home. Um, this was the, the, the the, the background uh, to this. Um, so anything that happens in Iraq or Syria co affects the, the rest of the Middle East. Um, I had a rather different... I thought the Americans might actually get away with overthrowing Saddam Hussein uh, in 2003, so long as they immediately left the country afterwards. Both the Kurds, the Shia didn't like Saddam, and the Sunni were pretty fed up with him. He'd been a pretty disastrous leader. The real mistake was occupying the country. And they did this because they didn't, there was a very specific reason. They didn't want the Iranians or the Syrians to benefit from the uh, fall of Saddam Hussein. And they, uh, and then no country in the Middle East uh, wanted, really wanted an American land army occupying Iraq. Uh, the neoconservatives in America were sort of boasting that the war in Iraq had been very easy. Um, 
and now today Baghdad, they were saying tomorrow Tehran and Damascus. Of course, the governments in Tehran and Damascus are ex were ex run by very tough people, and they thought, right, if that's the American plan, then we'll make sure they never stabilize Iraq. So they started uh, funding and uh, helping local dissident organizations, and both Sunni and uh, Shia. Um, Iraq at that time, I mean, it's, uh, as soon as Saddam went, it was obvious the Shia were going to take over. There was going to be a sort of uh, social revolution. Um, the Americans never really were able to recreate the Iraqi state. They haven't really been able to do it to this day. Um, although they keep on pretending there's a real Iraqi state. If you look at the American spokesman uh, talking about the attack on Mosul at the moment, he keeps on saying every, literally every second sentence, this is an Iraqi operation. It is not an American operation. The very fact he has to say so so often. I think reveals that it actually is an American org organization, uh, operation. Um, so, but they were never able to recreate uh, the Iraqi state. Those, um, and the very fact, you know, this so-called nation building by foreign powers, you know, the very fact of the government being created by a foreign power, in this case the U.S sort of delegitimized it in the eyes of the Iraqis from the word, from the word go. Um, the, just to sort of sketch the rest of the book, it goes on to 2011, the war in, in Libya. Uh, so I don't want to give the impression I think everything that was reported by these wars was wrong. Most of what was reported was right, but I think that often significant and sometimes crucial features were left out. And noticeably in Libya in 2011, uh, the way I thought there was a romanticization of the rebels, a demonization of Gaddafi. And the war was really fought by NATO. The war would not have, Gaddafi would not have gone down. The rebels would have been defeated in a few weeks uh, if, they, the, if NATO had not been assisting them and basically running the war. As a consequence, when Gaddafi went down, uh, when he was killed, you didn't have an opposition movement which was in any way capable of replacing him. There was a vacuum created and no way of filling that vacuum. So consequently, Syria, uh, Libya broke up into, uh, you know, into an anarchy ruled by criminalized militias. Um, all these people knew you know, that there was money there, there was oil revenue, they wanted to get their hands on it. Um, one aspect of the Libyan crisis was it was noticeable how the opposition movements had very sophisticated PR operations. In Benghazi, I remember, you know, there was a spokesman for the opposition who was a, a Libyan woman, I think highly educated, I think she's a professor in London, who was spokesman for the opposition, very convincing. She was very liberal, secular, and so forth. She was a woman. Uh, if you thought she was a typical example of the Syrian op of the Libyan opposition, you would have been completely wrong. When the opposition won and they moved to um, the transitional government, moved to Tripoli, the capital, the first announcement they made was that they were ending the ban on polygamy that Gaddafi had introduced. Uh, so that was really much more telling about their social and political attitudes than the spokesman that we'd all been listening to. At that time also you went down to the front line, there were actually more journalists than fighters there. And even the fighters were all bunched up in a very unmilitary way. Um, it's curious that, uh, sorry this isn't quite relevant to, but one thing I've found strange in Europe during all these episodes is that voters don't seem to blame governments for, there's no doubt that European governments played a leading role in getting rid of Gaddafi, creating this political vacuum and these conditions in which Libya uh, is now the channel through which migrants are crossing, attempting to cross the Mediterranean, many of them drowning every week. It's also become one of the main 
conduits for drugs crossing the, um, crossing the Mediterranean. Uh, voters don't seem to blame European governments for creating this situation in which uh, uh, extreme jihadis have flourished, crime has flourished, uh, people have been impoverished, and migrants, the, this Libyan coast is about 2,000 kilometers long, take advantage of this uh, coast to, to cross into Europe. Um, a lot of this book is focused on Iraq and Syria, because that's the center of the uh, conflict. Um, again, quite a lot of things which have happened, you know, were, were, weren't, were pretty obvious to political li politicians in the area at the time. I remember 2011, 12 in Iraq, uh, Iraqi politicians saying to me, if the war in Syria goes on, it will restart the sectarian civil, Sunni Shia civil war in Iraq. We can't stop it. Now, preserve, I'm sure they were telling this to European American leaders, but it seemed to have absolutely no effect whatsoever. And of course, they were dead right. This is what happened. Al Qaeda in Iraq had become weakened. It was still there, but it had a lot of experienced people who'd been fighting for years. People ask, you know, why is Islamic State so powerful? Well, partly it's a religious cult. Um, uh, with and has people in it who are prepared to get killed. That's what you need for a, a strong army, is people who are prepared to get killed. You may have a movement which is full of people who uh, support you, but if they're not prepared to die, they don't make very good soldiers. Uh, Islamic State did have this. It had former office, officers from Saddam's army, but it also had a wealth of uh, military experience. So it was in a very good position to intervene in Syria uh, in 2011, 12. It set up this front organization, Jabhat al-Nusra. Uh, it very rapidly took up, up over big parts of the, uh, of the country. Um, again, um, there was a time from quite early on, 2012, there was a belief outside uh, Syria, that uh, Bashar al-Assad was going to go at any moment, that he would go like Gaddafi had gone. But the situation was very different in, in Syria from, Iraq, from uh, Libya. Um, uh, Assad had the support of the Alawite community, had a, uh, the minorities, Druze, Christians, and the others. Whether they liked Assad or not, they knew the alternative meant they'd either be dead or would have to become refugees. Uh, and it was obvious that Assad simply wasn't going to go as he controlled, uh, you know, there are 14 provincial capitals in Syria. He controlled, I think, at that moment, 13 of them. Uh, but it, it's a strange thing. But there was a belief, and last to this day, in, sort of, in European and, uh, capitals and in Washington, that somehow it's quite easy to get rid of Assad. But uh, it's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing that he should be there, but it's just he's going to remain. Uh, and this is one of the difficulties of being a journalist in this situation, that, and this keeps sort of happening to me, that you try and explain events, which may be good or bad, but this is interpreted as justifying those events. So you explain that Assad is going to remain for various political military reasons. People say, aha, you're pro-Assad, but they, that's not what you're doing. You're just explaining what the landscape is. And you know that you, happens in Europe, particularly happens in the Middle East. I remember by the end of 2012, early around that period, uh, going from Lebanon to Syria. And I'd been talking to a Syrian um, film director who was in exile in Beirut, having a cup of coffee with him. And uh, he was you know, very anti-Assad, hoping Assad would go. And then I went to Damascus. It's obvious Assad wasn't going to go, so I reported that. Then when I was returning to Lebanon and I switched my Syrian phone to a Lebanese phone, and as I switched it on, this same guy was screaming down the phone at me, shame on you, shame on the independent. Uh, why do you say Assad is uh, stay, going to stay? So I said, well, these various reasons. And he said, no, 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 you should say that you know, his government is divided, they're going to fall. Uh, a lot of the, this was basically wishful thinking. But it was this wishful thing that was, was very pervasive then, very pervasive now. You have lots of people opposed to uh, Assad, 
you have a big Syrian political opposition in exile and uh, so forth. But they don't have much influence back in Syria. The, the armed opposition is really dominated by Salafi jihadis, um, notably Islamic State, al-Nusra, and some other groups. Um, but uh, Islamic State may be getting weaker. Al-Nusra is probably getting stronger. It's rather popular uh, among Sunni Arabs. It's, less, it's a bit less violent than uh, ISIS, not much. Uh, but you know, it's it's the same, the same sort of uh, ideology. Um, the uh, so then also in the book I try to describe not only the success of Islamic State, and that should have been very predictable because in early two thousand and fourteen, they captured uh, Fallujah, um, the Iraqi army couldn't get them out. By that stage, they were sort of active in an area in Iraq and Syria, which are about the size of Great Britain. Uh, foreign governments didn't seem to pay any attention. President Obama com compared them to a junior uh, league, uh, a junior basketball team trying to play in the big leagues. This is the person with the access to all the information from all these American uh, intelligence agencies. Some of which said now that they were telling him the right thing at the time, but some of them probably were. But uh, certainly in the higher reaches of the American government, they really didn't know what was going on. Um, so it, shouldn't, it wasn't that much of a surprise when they captured Mosul. It shouldn't have been that much a surprise when they captured Mosul. The other thing I try and interpret in the book is why their opponents were so weak. So, I mean, uh, you know, why was the Iraqi army so weak? Billions of dollars have been poured into it. It was very big, there were about 350,000 men. Uh, well, the answer is it didn't really have 350,000 men, but a lot of them, it was full of ghost battalions, in which you, it, you'd have a battalion meant to be 600 men. In fact, it had 150, and the officers would pocket the salaries in between, the food and everything, money for food and everything else, uh, weapons, which they'd sell on the black market. Just after the fall of uh, Mosul, I was in Baghdad and I was talking to a a four-star Iraqi general, he'd just been sort of retired, as any effective general was from the Iraqi, at that uh, Iraqi army at that time, saying, why, you know, why did this happen? Why was the Iraqi army so weak? And he said, well, you know, corruption, corruption, corruption. At that time, you wanted to be a colonel in the Iraqi army, it cost you about $200,000. You wanted to be a general of an active division, it cost you about $2 million. Reason is, as I mentioned, ghost battalions, other things, you had checkpoints on the road. All these checkpoints to this day act like customs barriers. You know, you're driving your truck through, uh, let's say, from Kirkuk to uh, Baghdad. It's not very far, it's about three hours, or maybe less. But every checkpoint you go through, you have to pay off, and pay off quite a lot. So Kirkuk to Baghdad, probably an extra $1,500. Um, and it's one of the reasons everything's so expensive in the markets in Baghdad and the shops. Um, but the guys running this checkpoint, the soldiers, that how they, that's how they made their money. The same thing happens in Syria. Uh, the Syri if you're a soldier in the Syrian army, you get about $50 a, a month. It's not enough to live on and feed your family. So you have to make money by taking small bribes. If you're running a checkpoint, any car that comes past, you know, you get a few, not very much, you know, a few Syrian pounds. But if it's an, you know, a truck or some, some goods like that, and uh, you, can, um, you can make a lot of money. Of course, you have to kick back to other people. Um, so, you know, the Iraqi army, very weak. Uh, I remember a friend of mine in Baghdad saying, actually about 18 months before this happened, I was saying, it can't be that weak, as you say. And he said, you know, you don't understand the Iraqi army. They're not soldiers, they're investors. They're people who enjoyed the army in order to make money, not to fight anybody. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what happened. To some degree, it's still like that. It's a bit better. It's sort of psychology. It just sort of requires the Americans to be there to give them uh, some confidence. But it's sort of on television. And there are some good units, but they aren't very many. Uh, and they tend to be used too much. So uh, the, uh, basically, it's weaker than it looks. Uh, and I think if there wasn't American air power, when I've covered sort of fights, they've actually sort of uh, generally d Islamic State would still win if it wasn't for American uh, air power. Uh, so, um, 
I'm going to stop speaking in a minute. Um, the, the, a book tries to give a picture of what really happened during these wars. And all these wars now affect us here in Europe. I think that basically the Europeans didn't really cottoned on that these wars really affected them until last year when you have the migrants of hundreds of thousands of people trying to reach Central Europe and uh, you had the terrorist attacks in uh, France and Belgium. Uh, maybe it's the migrants aren't moving, there haven't been terrorist attacks, maybe that's uh, dying away now, but it sort of, it, it, I'm sure it'll come back because one of the features of Islamic State is that when it's, it, it has sort of, terrorism is integrated into its sort of tactical repertoire. Uh, so when it's doing badly on the battlefield, it likes to project uh, fear, uh, it likes to project strength by uh, terrorist atrocities like the ones we saw in uh, Paris. Uh, and also show that it's still in business. It likes, it's very media conscious, it likes to dominate the uh, the news agenda and it does so uh, quite successfully uh, so you know it seems to be very unlikely that we won't have uh, some uh, more attacks in Europe and of course the number of attacks in Europe is nothing to what they get in Baghdad and elsewhere you may have seen that a bomb attack in the Karada district of uh, Baghdad a couple of months ago killed 300 people um, so you know will stability return to the Middle East it's very little, one can't quite, one can't see that happening. Um, in fact, the instability still seems to be spreading. Uh, none of these wars are really ending. Uh, Mosul falls. This is a big blow to ISIS, but the war will go on in Iraq. East Aleppo falls. Um, this is a big plus for Assad. But the war isn't going to end there. Uh, sectarianism is very deep. And also all the sort of domestic actors, they all have their foreign sponsors, their foreign backers. Uh, they aren't going to go away. Um, and the longer it goes on, the more powers that get drawn in. Syria is really now sort of six or seven uh, crises wrapped into one. And that makes it extraordinarily difficult to uh, disentangle the, uh, you've got obviously a popular revolution originally against a dictator, but it very r rapidly became sectarian and it very rapidly became uh, militarized. So it became uh, Sunni against uh, others. Uh, you have Sunni against Shia in the region, you have Iran against Saudi Arabia, you've got Arab against uh, uh, Kurd, you've got Kurd against Arab and Kurd against Turk. Um, you have the Cold War between Russia and America and the Europeans coming back. So all these crises come together. Um, but I, st I feel that whatever we do, one needs just better information than what's happening there. And uh, that's what I've tried to provide in this book. Thank you. Patrick Cockburn for this um, introduction. Thank you very much, Patrick, for this um, introduction, for your presentation on the level of complexity that we have in Middle East. Patrick, in his book, refers to the Sykes-Picot of these borders uh, drawn by a Frenchman and an Englishman a century ago, and precisely a uh, group such as Daesh has uh, eliminated, uh, at least between Syria and Iraq. Jesus, maybe we can uh, look at one of the maps. We have a map behind us. We can see the areas dominated by Islamic State in Iraq and Syria in green, and those that are controlled by the Iraqi um, state in blue areas controlled by Syrian state and then the other rebel forces in Syria and MOVE and 
the borders as we knew them before no longer exist and the comment that I was mentioning, mentioned by Patrick, and these borders in some areas uh, disappear, in others they still exist, and something that is of great concern when we compare this to the end of the Ottoman uh, Empire is the uh, displacement of populations due to uh, the factors that Patrick Patrick was mentioning, uh, or such as in India and Pakistan with the separation uh, according to the religion and with uh, very dramatic results. And Patrick uh, Cogburn also mentions this in his book. This is seen in uh, the case of uh, Iraq. If we divide the country in three, this will uh, lead to a massacre uh, even bigger than what we are currently seeing. I'm going to give the floor now to Daniel Iriarte so that he uh, uh, presents uh, and then uh, asks a few questions for Patrick. So, Daniel, you have the floor. I want to to say that I'm profoundly grateful to Casa Arabe and Capitan Swin for being for the opportunity of being here and to share this space with one of the biggest references that I've had during my professional career. I'm now the deputy chief of the international sector of Confidencial, but during seven years I've been a correspondent of uh, the newspaper ABC. Uh, I was in Turkey and I traveled uh, in around the region, and I've covered many of the crises that uh, Patrick mentions in his book. I was very young during the invasion of uh, Iraq, and I was studying journalism, but Libya, Syria, the Kurdish conflict, part of what has happened in Iraq during the last years, etc. So for me, it is fascinating to read this book. A lot of the experiences that I've had uh, to see them uh, in the book, how Patrick uh, talks about them uh, is really incredible. I take my hat off to him. I remember in 2011 with uh, the mountains in Libya and I was on, on top of a rebel tank near uh, the Nafusa Hills and I was near the, the tank, I could see the turret and this was to impede the um, bombs from the, uh, uh, that, uh, from the rebels so that this wouldn't happen. And this is also uh, narrated by Patrick in his book with the dates, etc. And this is fascinating for me. Uh, considering that I've also worked in Istanbul, I think I'm probably one of the few Spanish journalists who has uh, read most of Patrick's uh, work because I've had to uh, study uh, extensively the region. Not only, well, not to say that there's no interest in uh, Patrick's uh, books here in Spain. I think only the two last ones have been published and translated. And it's a shame because the quality is really excellent and I encourage Capital Swing uh, to uh, publish more of them because they are very educational. I was very young in 2003. I was studying journalism, as I mentioned. And I was interested in Iraq's uh, news. I was following uh, what was happening there, current affairs. Uh, Sunai, uh, Shiite, uh, insurgents, the death squadrons, bits and pieces here and there, but for me it didn't really make sense. I, it was very difficult for me to understand why. And it didn't acquire full meaning until I read uh, Patrick's book, The Occupation, uh, the Iraq's Occupation. And suddenly everything was explained in a very educational way. Wait. And uh, 
the era of Yehad is an extensive narration of um, many episodes of Middle East. I follow Middle East closely. I read many journalists that cover the region, but I think Patrick, Patrick is the person who is telling us or having the best insights with regard to this region. Why is this? Well, I think one of the uh, reasons is because he has historical uh, perspectives. Who nowadays uh, remembers uh, the sanctions in uh, Iraq, for example? Uh, and without those sanctions, you cannot understand the current situation of Iraq now. And nobody remembers that. Second reason is that he's a journalist that questions things. Uh, a great example is the article that he published last week in The Independent, talking about the media coverage of two cases, two um, in the east of Aleppo and Mosul that he's mentioned now during his presentation, and how in one case we're talking about unifying those, uh, the governmental forces of Bashar al-Assad and Russia. I'm not saying that we don't have to be critical. Of course, there's an incredible destruction created by the bombs. But at the same time, we are narrating Mosul's situation as if there were no uh, civilian casualties, but we've heard about the atrocities of the uh, Shiite um, Militias, but this doesn't appear in the in the media. I've read again about the occupation um, preparing for the um, conference today, and I've got to another conclusion of why Patrick's journalism is so interesting and so important, and it's because most of his sources are local sources, whereas other journalists believe, or maybe they don't believe, but um, they can not uh, do otherwise, but believing uh, what a speaker from the coalition tells them. Patrick has different sources in Syria and Iraq, and many of them are his friends. He, if you read the book, you will see that he mentions a lot of times, a friend of mine in Syria told me this, or a friend in Lebanon told me this. So this local connection is what allows him to really understand what's going on, because it's the people who are in during it right now, and they go beyond the propaganda. So there's one particular scene about al Sadr and the um, rebirth of the Shiite um, the rebirth of the Shiite movement that really fascinates me. Uh, many of the people here might remember that after the first world Gulf War, George Bush father. Um, called upon the Iraqi population to raise against uh, Saddam Hussein. Kurds and Shiites did so, and probably what Bush wanted was to have a coup d'etat, as we know now, but the thing is that the Kurds and the Shiites uh, actually raise, and for us, the Kurd um, uh, events were greatly, uh, were better known here in Spain, probably because of the ease of work, of traveling to, um, not to go to Erbil instead of Basora. But right now, the siege of Mosul, there are no means to, there are no sources, to, resources to send a journalist to the area or to, and let, let alone sending somebody to Basora to talk about something that happened 25 years ago. And this is what Patrick has done. He has talked to people who had felt this rise of the Shiites as a main event in their lives. And this is a crucial event in the contemporary history of the region. And Patrick does, goes and asks the people who really uh, lived through those times. And we would not know about this period if 
he didn't do so. The Middle East is interesting for us. I see it every day as a deputy editor in El Confidencial. I see that people really read these news and this is necessary because what happens in the Middle East affects us all. We have seen this already during the refugees crisis to understand the situation if you don't know what has been going on in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran and Syria in the past 10 years is basically impossible and um, sometimes I think for what Patrick has been saying before I think he would agree with me in this I think that what is happening right now in the Middle East is technically a world war we are not calling it a third world war because there is no civilian population from the western countries involved in this war the armies are but since we don't have a war economy in our countries it seems that this is not a, a, the third world war however it is a conflict that has very important uh, branches and and um, derivations and um, it affects us all when we have seen this in the uh, streets full of blood in, in Paris, for instance, or in Brussels, and on some uh, beaches that are visited by our tourists. And so to ignore what's happening right now in the Middle East is suicidal, and we should be very grateful that we have people who tell us about this and go beyond the headlines because sometimes we might think that this is a mere conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites because how would you explain for instance uh, the Yemeni um, president to be allied with the Shiites against the Sunni government you wouldn't understand it if, if you simplify it all as a, as a war between um, Russia and the states, the scenario is much more complex than the simplistic explanations tell us. So we need to be very thankful to people like Patrick who give us a wider and greater vision and a greater view that makes it also the most accurate view on what's going on right now. And I think that what you all want is to listen to Patrick. So I would like to ask him several questions. The first one is a bit more personal, and the second one is more like uh, as an ana in, a quality to, in his quality as an analyst. And I'm going to ask him you in have English. You devoted uh, a big deal of your professional life to, to the Middle East. Uh, where does this uh, interest come from? I mean, where does your interest in the, in the region come from? Well, I did. I was born in Ireland, although I'm sort of English as well. And I did my first degree in Oxford, and I was doing my PhD at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, part of it was I was interested in the 1970s, there was a war going. Uh, there was a, a fairly nasty war going on in uh, Northern Ireland. So I had an early interest in sectarian warfare and uh, the politics of that. Then in 1975, I moved to Lebanon and part of the time in Cyprus, uh, because Lebanon has various things in common with Northern Ireland. Um, I haven't spent all my career in the Middle East. I've been twice correspondent. I used to work for Financial Times, then I switched to the Independent. I was, during sort of early Gorbachev, I was Financial Times correspondent in Moscow. Later, during 1999, 91, I was back in Moscow initially the Chechen war, uh, at the end Afghanistan, uh, the American invasion of Afghanistan. But, um, and I've been in the Washington as well. I, I, I've always been interested in it. And also it's just become the, for good or ill, mainly for ill, the focus of world politics. You know, when I first went to Iraq in the 1970s, People really didn't know anything about Iraq at all. You know, then you have Saddam Hussein takes over you have the Iran-Iraq war, you have the first Gulf War, the invasion of Kuwait. Iraq becomes, everybody becomes conscious of where Iraq is and its significance. Um, so I kept on being drawn back there, partly because I was interested, but also the people I was working for wanted me to go back. 
um, and um, um, yeah, I was also based in Jerusalem during the um, after the Oslo talks. There were many th interesting things happening covering covering Iraq, um, but it's become sort of the center of international confrontations uh, to an extraordinary degree that they're all focused on these deeply unstable regions. As I think I mentioned the sort of phrase tectonic plates, it's like a sort of earthquake zone. If earthquakes are going to take place, it's going to take place in this zone. Uh, and that's always been so in that area. Um, and it's uh, more, more tru truer than ever. Um, the, um, so that's, that's really the reason that I've, I've kept going back there, my own interest, but actually the interest of the people I work for, and to a degree, you know, people in general want to know what's happening there. Um, however, nowadays, uh, I would say that you are one of the biggest, uh, biggest probably not the world, but one of the most insightful analysts on on the Middle East. Uh, so in that uh, character, I would like to ask you. Now we are seeing uh, an offensive, an ongoing offensive on Mosul, uh, a coming one on Raqqa, uh, another one in Sirte, in Libya, against the Islamic State. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, uh, the difference between the Islamic State and previous jihadi groups is that they manage I mean, of course, the savagery has been uh, over previous, and that's probably the reason why in, uh, in the West we are so fascinated with, fascinated, you know, understand me, uh, with the group. But for uh, their supporters, the big difference is that they proclaim actually the caliphate, you know? Yes. So in that sense, they managed to control a big a swath of, swath of terrain. So my question would be, now that they are preparing to withdraw from these capitals of the caliphate, can the Islamic State survive without a terrain? The Islamic State as an administration or as a movement? Mm. Oh, you know, the Islamic State is the name, <laughs> in a sense, of the caliphate. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always very, very important, you're quite right, that this was a state. You had people saying, oh, it's not really like a state, but actually it was exactly like a state in that it had its own very powerful army, it had its um, administration, it collected taxes, it administered schools, hospitals, everything else. Uh, and I think that that was very important. And lots of people have talked about establishing a caliphate, a sort of God's kingdom on earth but nobody had done anything about it. So this made them different, as you say, from all other movements, and I think was very <laughs> important. They lose that, I think that's a very important loss, because they go back to being like a lot of other dissident movements. It also means they've got far less resources, you know, when it comes to anything like terrorism and so forth. You know, if you're a terrorist network in Europe, it gets broken up. If you're backed by a state, if terrorism backed by a state, then those networks can be recreated. You know, new personnel can be sent out, expertise can be passed on, money, weapons, etc. If you don't have a state, you can't do that. So I think that is a very uh, important change if, as a sort of administrative state, uh, the caliphate ceases to exist. Um, but of course, that's not the end of things. Um, it will continue, but I agree. I think the, if they lose Mosul, Raqqa, and elsewhere, these are very genuine defeats that will leave it weaker. But this... But, uh, this wouldn't mean that they lose a big deal of the appeal that they can have to young Muslims over the world to join the movement. I mean, Maybe they wouldn't be, wouldn't they be uh, thrown into irrelevance, to say so? Not maybe irrelevance, but you know, they're less exciting. 
the less interesting. They're less, you know, from 2014. They also had a sort of Napoleonic run of victories against more powerful, you know, they defeated the Iraqi army, they defeated the Kurdish Peshmerga, they inflicted defeats on the Syrian army. Uh, they seem to be sort of all victorious. That also has gone. These are important setbacks. But you also have, you know, the Sunni Arab communities in those areas uh, still very alienated. You still have other jihadi organizations like Al Nusra, which is um, a bit rather sort of less spectacularly violent, but in many ways the same part of Islamic State may transmute into Al Nusra. Uh, so it's not gone by any means, but, but it certainly is weaker. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, now we have a big mess in the old uh, Middle East and North, uh, North Africa, I mean, and Far East mm -hmm. and uh, Arc. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, let's say that the Islamic State disappears, uh, Western mm. intervention. You don't seem to be very enthusiastic about uh, this offensive against Mosul and Raqqa as the way of uh, finding a solution to, to <coughs> the situation. So mm. every time that there's a terrorist attack in, in, uh, in a Western country or in, against mm. Western objectives, there are a lot of voices who say, uh, something has to be done to yeah. solve this problem. Yeah. But nobody knows what. So since you are not very enthusiastic, uh, I mean, I don't think you, you believe that this, uh, well, I don't know. Uh, well, I think, I think it's quite important to defeat mm -hmm. the Islamic State. I mean, mm -hmm. it's quite important to take back Mosul. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's rather amazing they haven't done anything about it for, two, for a couple of, over you know, two years. Um, so that is quite important. Um, but I don't think it'll be the end of it. Mm -hmm. Because also, you know, the sort of... Lots of people now are competing to fill the vacuum left by uh, ISIS if it's no longer in Mosul. Just like in 2003, lots of different countries, communities were competing to fill the vacuum left by the fall of Saddam Hussein. Um, you know, I, I was in Mosul the day it fell to the Kurds. Uh, the Iraqi army disappeared. You know, and immediately there was fighting between the Arabs and the Kurds, literally within two or three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, so what will happen in Mosul? Um, the Kurds want to take the area around Mosul. They want to take disputed areas. But um, the Turks want to have a say in what is happening. Uh, you know, there's lots of fertile ground for more disputes there. Uh, and the same thing is happening in Syria. Who's going to hold Aleppo? You know, what's going to be the long-term future of the Kurds? Um, the, uh, and there are so many players involved. Um, the, it's very difficult to get them all to agree to a peace. And obviously some of them, you know, al-Nusra, for instance, has absolutely no reason to agree to a ceasefire in which it's not included. There's every reason to break that ceasefire. Um, the, the, you also just have, I think, in the area, such a high level of violence. You know, people talk about, you know, negotiating an end to the war, that there'll be a power sharing. But how can you have power sharing between people who've been trying to kill each other for years? and can't even sit in the same room. Uh, I think you have to do it by stages. You have to try and reduce the level of violence. In Northern Ireland, we used to say you couldn't, you couldn't negotiate if things were dominated by the, what we call the politics of the last atrocity. If there'd been an atrocity recently by one side or the other, you couldn't have really negotiations. Everything in the Middle East, in Iraq and Syria, is dominated by the last atrocities. And this goes right down, not just at the top, but you know, if, you, if you're in an area, now Christians and others are going back to the villages just east of Aleppo, oh, sorry, east of Mosul. Uh, 
Christians going down. There was a Syrian Catholic town called uh, Karakosh. It had about 50,000 people in it. They spoke Aramaic. It was an sort of interesting place. And, um, but all these people there, they used to have good relations with the Sunni villagers round about. But now they think the Sunni villagers were all allied to Islamic State. Uh, and some of them have, will have fled with Islamic State. That proves in the eyes of the Christians that they're always with them. Or if they stay, they say they're sleeper cells. That's a phrase you keep on hearing in Syria and Iraq is, you know, a perfectly ordinary village. Oh, it's full of Sunni village, it's full of sleeper cells. So, you know, the atmosphere is very paranoid. Um, and that sectarianism goes right down to the grassroots. People don't want, you know, Kurds don't want Sunni Arabs in their village because they think they're going to uh, ally themselves with the Islamic State. And of course the Sunni feel that they're being persecuted as well. Um, uh, they, uh, and it's very difficult to reduce that level of religious and uh, ethnic hatred. Bien, pues eh, hemos llegado al, al final de, de la conferencia. Eh, end of this, uh, conference. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you, um, Daniel Idearki, and of course, Mr. Patrick Cockburn. You can uh, see his book on sale outside this hall. You, uh, if you want to, may uh, buy it. And Patrick has kindly offered to include uh, signing the book for you, even though he's very tired. And this has been a very long day for him, but he has been kind enough to offer himself to, to do that for you. So if you want to see the video also, you will see it on our website in a couple of days. Thank you very much. Good night.